Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Cloud Logging and Security. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Justin Henderson, Certified SANS Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Justin. Thanks, Carol. So everybody, hopefully you're coming here for cloud logging and security. Uh, real quick, I just want to hash why I made this. Um, I do a lot of professional service work. I own my own company under HA Security Solutions. And I swear it's every week, for sure every month, but it, it's pretty much every week at this point, where I'll have clients and organizations say, okay, this whole SIM logging, analytics, all that's great and all, but what about all the cloud? How do I get that data in? What am I looking for? And so I've been asked this so much that I, I put this presentation together to try to address this more so on the cloud logging than specifically like what to alert on. Because once you figure out what cloud logs to gather, it actually becomes pretty easy to figure out, well, why did I gather that in the first place? What am I using that for? So this is what we're gonna be talking about today. The first couple slides are just kind of a ramp up and then all of a sudden we're gonna dive right in. So if you're thinking this is gonna to be too abstract, well, you're probably looking at the first three slides of content. <laughs> then we start diving in and it'll probably get a little bit uh, fuzzy. So uh, my name is Justin Henderson. I am the author of SEC 555, SIM with Tactical Analytics. I also co-author SEC 455, SIM Design, with, uh, SIM Design and Implementation. I also co-author SEC 530, Defensible Security Architecture and Engineering. And I actually just finished writing a new course on massive tactical data handling at scale with Logstash. It is not currently released, um, but a lot of that is, is coming out. And, and I love that stuff, as you can tell. Um, I've got 61 certifications, which just really means I doubled down on IT and InfoSec because I, I love this field. It's not a chore for me. Like, the challenge of getting to where I've been fortunate enough to get is because I've surrounded myself with really awesome people like Seth Mesner, Eric Conrad, John Hubbard, and I don't have hobbies. <laughs> I do have a hobby in that I have a pet farm. I've got miniature horses, donkeys, and all sorts of animals. Uh, but I spend a lot of time with my family and a lot of time in computers, and, I, and I'm just loving every day of it. The GitHub link, which is on this page, as well as the next one, uh, those are chock full of the presentations I've given, as well as tons of free scripts, solutions, just anything that I come up with, I like to open source back to the community. And some of those folks that I surround myself with that I get the fortune of working with, they do the same thing. So we try to collectively put this under our company. So h and Security Solutions will have a whole bunch of things in here. For today's talk specifically, I don't expect everybody on the webcast or listening to this recording to be like a master of all things cloud. Because if you were, you, you wouldn't be on this webcast, you already know it. So if you are at least somewhat familiar with cloud and the different variations, that's all I'm, I'm asking for. And, and we'll quickly go through this in the next couple slides, and then I'm gonna dive right in. So let's start at the beginning. Cloud logging. What is it? <laughs> uh, someone walks up to me and they're like, okay, Justin, how do I do cloud logging? And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, well, what, what do you mean by cloud logging? Because that is that's so abstract. Because in truth, a lot of folks, what you're thinking in your head is cloud logging is I need to get all the logs from the cloud. And that's not really the right definition you should be looking for because the cloud means too many different things. I used to joke in my um, my system system administrator days because I get a lot of a lot of like my directors or administration walking up. And, hey, go deploy Active Directory. 
I was like, okay, how many servers do you want me to deploy it on? They're like, oh, well, it's just one thing, right? It's like, no. <laughs> and I would ask that question because Active Directory used to drive me nuts because it's not one thing. It's a group of things. It's domain controllers. There's the five FISMO roles. You have to be able to properly talk to it, which requires DHCP and DNS. We've got group policy. We've got authentication like Kerberos and NT like It's a combination or accumulation of multiple disparate technologies, but we wrap it into one holistic word and we call it Active Directory. Yes, there's Active Directory users and computers, but that's just for the authentication accounts stored on a domain controller. And with cloud logging, it's the same thing over again because we like to say cloud, but it means many disparate cumulative technologies. So I want you to start thinking of this cloud logging problem a little differently. When you say cloud logging, what I'm really looking for is what in the cloud are you trying to collect and is it worth collecting? For example, I hear cloud, what I'm usually thinking is, oh, you, you do a lot of hosting in Amazon or Azure or Google or Oracle or, or maybe you have a bunch of SaaS applications like Sales, Salesforce. Box.com, and you've got all these different technologies all over the place that you're subscribing to and using. Well, what pieces of those log, and what of those logs do you care about? So I tend to break it down into three parts. And you start at the beginning. You first do a discovery phase, and literally this means sitting down with your team and coming up with a list of cloud assets or sources or services you're using, given what those do, what of those do you think logs and why would you care? For example, in Salesforce, yes, it has logs. You can pull them, there's an API for that. What do those logs consist of and do you care? Like, is it just about new entries into the CRM? Is it about people potentially logging in to steal access to all that data? Like, what are you looking for? In Azure, well, again, which piece of Azure? Are you looking at the tenant? Someone's creating a new a global administrator account, which then can access everything? Okay, yeah, I, I totally care about that. Well, what about Office 365? Because you're doing sensitive files in SharePoint and OneDrive and, okay, now you're seeing what I'm talking about by Discover. We're walking through this process of figuring out what cloud sources we have, but we're not saying cloud, Really what I'm saying is data sources, because they're each individual data sources that just happen to fall under cloud logging. But don't keep it so abstract, drill down. And don't worry, I've got like one more slide past this one and then we'll start diving in more deeply. This is, this, this is what I mean by the first couple slides are a higher level. Once you have those data sources and you, you mold over with the team on why you might care, because to be honest, when you see some of the logs, you won't care <laughs> for some of the data sources. Then the ones you decide to collect, you flip to the, okay, well, how do I actually get it into, and then whatever you're using. Is it a SIM? Is it a log management system? Like, what are you doing? How do I collect it? And we'll talk about that. And then at the end, once you have the logs on, logs in, we start to analyze them. We start to look for abuse and anomalies and user behaviors. We won't focus so much on analyze because though the analysis techniques are the same as, well, really any data source, on-premise, DNS logs, uh, and I've got tons and tons of webcasts on doing analysis and alerting. So I'm focusing primarily on figuring out what cloud sources matter and then kind of how do, how do we collect them. So when we're dealing with the cloud, We've got effectively four categories of data sources. And these are directly tied to the type of cloud service. So just real quickly going through this, we've got infrastructure as a service, IaaS. In this case, this is like hosting virtual machines on Amazon EC2, doing virtual machines on Google Compute, doing a Azure virtual machine. Literally, you're just putting Windows or Linux, some flavor of operating system on a virtual machine, you have full control of the virtual machine at that point. In that case, it's infrastructure as a service. Because it's just a virtual machine and you have access to it, the data sources and log collection methods are just like they would be traditionally. 
They have syslog daemons on them. You've got Windows in that forwarding, or you could always drop a third-party log agent. I won't talk about those traditional methods because we're really talking cloud, so we're looking for the more harder to reach log sources. Platform as a service, well, that's where we are not in charge of everything. Now, all of a sudden, the third party is taking care of some of this. This would be like Heroku. This would be uh, things that I could put like WordPress sites. Um, maybe you're just uploading programming uh, web service files, but you're not ch in charge of all the other backend services. Well, that's platform as a service. You're, you're abstracting yourself from some of those components. Oddly enough, a lot of the platform as a service controls, you still have the same logs. For example, I could be using Elastic Beanstalk for a PHP web service, and yet I still have web server logs. I could still do the same level of PHP logging and MySQL logging. The difference is I'm not gonna drop a log agent inside a VM. Instead, I have to go through the platform as a service and figure out where it logs, and then I get access to the same logs. So it's changing the collection, but it's not changing the data source necessarily, depending on what platform you're using. Software as a service is where, well, someone wrote some really cool software or application, and you're just subscribing or purchasing it from them. This would be like Salesforce. This could be Box.com, Dropbox, Office 365. You don't maintain the servers, you just utilize that application service, but you have critical data on it. Office 365, I, I use that personally. I've got tons and tons of sensitive data on Office 365. So now I have to go above and beyond to secure, classify, do things like Azure information protection or some type of DLP. I have to put policies around that. I have to know when people are moving sensitive data into folders or onto their machines when it should have been in that SaaS application in certain folders under certain conditions. And so now I need to get access to those logs, but they're not on my system. So I have to get the cloud logs for Office 365, constantly monitor those, otherwise I'm in big trouble. <laughs> And then last, kind of the new kid on the block, it's not really that new, but function as a service, or what you probably heard to as serverless. And this is where you're running code as software, or software as code, I flipped those. This would be things like Lambda functions, where you're literally paying for code execution, and you could have something like a static website, but everything that's dynamic goes through Lambda functions. And those can log as well. But the third party, again, is control and dictates how we're doing those. So all of these have application logs. Some of these were, have other types. Now, here's where we're gonna start getting to the meat of this conversation. I've got three scenarios for you. Basically, I've got a mock entity that I use in 555, which is LabMe and Corporate. It's a fake company. There's a fake website, www.labmeinc.com. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about this mock company and what cloud sources they use across three different um, cloud providers. And I'm gonna use that to walk through the discover, collect, analyze concept, because it's gonna be a lot easier for you to relate to it, because I'm sure you're probably using some of these services. So I'm breaking them down by vendor, like this first one's Amazon, and then we'll talk through like what will it look like from a discovery phase, how do you actually grab those logs, and then the, at the end we'll talk about analysis. So with Amazon, LabMe Inc. is currently using tiered applications. Think like uh, web services with backend databases, Nginx and MySQL as a basic example. And they're putting them on top of EC2. So they're basically virtual machines. They're running something like a CentOS, a Ubuntu server. They're, they're running systems as virtual machines. They're SSHing into them, configuring them to run the web services, they're configuring them to run the databases. That's traditional logging concepts. Well, they're also using some of the same type of technologies, but they're in the process of flipping them to Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Beanstalk is, instead of IaaS, it's a platform as a service. And they're doing this because they're trying to ease the labor and operations of monitoring the, the virtual machines and patching those virtual machines and hardening them. 
Well, they really just want to run, you know, their Nginx services, their PHP code, or whatever programming language that they're doing. And so they start to convert to this platform as a service. Well, they're still technically running the same applications. They're just running them with less overhead. They're letting Beanstalk dynamically spin up new, new instances, and they're just pushing that to Amazon. Well, they still need the application logs for those, though, because they need to see if someone's attacking the sites, uh, abusing the logic and the programming code. Like, they still have to have visibility of that. Well, they're also because, well, everybody's doing it, right? They're, they're checking out containers. Like, they have uh, ECS, the uh, I'm sorry, the Elastic Container Service. They have the Elastic Kubernetes Service on Amazon. And they're dipping their toes in this water, being like, hey, containers, that stuff is pretty cool. Personally, I, I know there seems like a, a decent amount of blogs lately on why containers are not the answer. I love containers. I think it's substantially better. I wish I was using them way earlier, even before it was Docker. Uh, I find it simplifies my life, makes it more portable. I love it. I don't care if it's persistent storage or not. All right, sorry. Sidebar, <laughs> I like containers. So I could still have Nginx and MySQL and all that stuff on containers, but now the logging mechanisms have changed even more drastically. With Elastic Beanstalk, it was managing and deploying instances on your behalf, but it still kind of gave you access to the logs in a more traditional method. With containers, well, the logs are often in the containers and the containers get purged dynamically. And there goes your logs. <laughs> so we have to look at those differently. I actually did a webcast a couple weeks ago called Contain Myself. You can pull it out of the uh, SANS archive if you're listening to this. And I go through pretty deeply on how to do container logging specifically for both on-prem and in the cloud. Uh, we'll talk through it a little bit here in this one as well. And then lastly, they're also playing with function at, uh, as a service. They're doing some static websites because let's say they have a bunch of healthcare clinics each clinic is just static HTML files at this point. And then like the contact forms and the dynamic pieces of the site that send emails or do any kind of uh, look patient lookup. Well, those are now Lambda functions and they use things like Kinesis or uh, their, their RDS database services. And they also interact with S3 buckets for storage. Well, Ooh, that, that's a little brutal because those are newer technologies and Lambda logs, Kinesis logs, S3 bucket can do auditing logs. And we've got all these different technologies now, but we have to stop and think first and foremost, what was the goal in the first place? Like, what are we doing with cloud logging? Is it important that I get EC2 logs and Beanstalk logs and ECS and EKS and Lambda and Kinesis and S3 logs? Or am I trying to gather specific data sources like I want to see attacks against those Nginx and MySQL services? Well, I can run Nginx and MySQL on EC2, Beanstalk, EKS. I'm not really going to do those on Lambda and Kinesis. But each one is logging different layers of the application, and that's really what I'm trying to profile and alert on. But I also care about the tenant, like who is trying to log into my Amazon console and portal and change things. So I still have the applications as I've traditionally had a data source, and then I have extra data sources about monitoring the platforms, not platform as a service, but like the Amazon console. So Try to focus here for a second, because remember, we're starting in discovery. Don't dive directly into collection, because this is why your head will hurt. If you go straight into cloud logging from a, all right, I'm instantly going to figure out what matters and how to collect it all at once, that is too overwhelming, because there's more than one way to collect. Like, as you'll start to see as we finish this out, there's there might be three different ways of getting that data source because we're using cloud technologies. So initially, I'm gonna ask that you, you, you kind of back off a little bit. Focus first on what is the mission? Oh, we have web services. I need logs of the every time that web service is accessed. 
Uh, I need to see if someone's brute forcing it, trying to log into it, if they're running SQL injection. I want to profile user use versus scripted use so I can see those deviations and detect off of it. I also want to see who is making changes to the Amazon tenant. Focus on those because those are going to identify your data sources. Once you write those down, then you're ready to move on to the how to collect stage. So otherwise your, your head's just gonna explode here. So here's what I'm talking about. This is that same scenario, but all we're talking about is the web services and database services. So in here, let's say I have a simple two-tiered application, it's web service database. Well, that means you're running some type of web service, Apache or Nginx, that would might be on EC2 and Beanstalk or EKS. For the database, you might be running MySQL. If I'm doing Lambda functions, well, I'm not running Apache and Nginx, but I do have static files. Those are probably still on an Apache or Nginx or some type of web service, but then the functions that process things are going through Lambda. Okay, so this got weird. This got weird quick. So I've got web servers, which are either virtual machines, platform as a service, or like containers, but they might still be working with Lambda functions? Yes, so, because it's function as a service, not necessarily web services directly. So now I have Lambda being part of my web service stack. It's almost now a three-tier app. And then at this point, Lambda might be functioning using RDS or Kinesis or both, for how it's processing data. So, okay, lots of technologies at play, and now watch what happens from a logging perspective. EC2 and Beanstalk, well, those still have Amazon instances behind the scenes. EC2, you directly control. Beanstalk, they kind of auto spin these off for you, but they still give you access to things like bar log nginx. So now you have a web server access log and an air log, and it's in that folder. MySQL, you got Varlog MySQL because you're still kind of running virtual machines behind the hood and you have direct access to this stuff. EKS, containers, well, there's a stack driver in their container service. This actually works the same way for on-premise. I could be running Docker or Kubernetes and there's log drivers that I can essentially hook and then tell it to log somewhere. Well, on Amazon, you would probably log to CloudWatch, which is a central, kind of like a central pool for storing those logs. Or I could do a container that has a log agent that is directly associated with my web service or database services containers that can see the, the traditional like var log nginx, var log MySQL, and ship them off. So the how to collect is what starts getting really confusing because we have options. But initially, I'm, don't focus on that. Focus above the line, not below the line. What are the data sources? Apache, Nginx, Lambda, MySQL, RDS, Kinesis. Really, we're talking web. We're talking database access logs. And, of course, we still want to monitor the tenant. So for the tenant, really, when, I'm, when I say tenant, I'm talking about Amazon has many, many customers. You might be one of them. You have your own tenant. Because of that, you want to monitor your tenant, you absolutely should be monitoring your tenant. Who's creating new accounts? Who's spinning off new resources? How's your billing controlled? How are you providing access to guests, depending on what services you're using? These type of things you should be monitoring in all major tenants, Amazon, Azure, Google, you name it. Well, in Amazon, they have CloudTrail. CloudTrail, it defaults, it's currently 90 days free data that you can go in and just pull up these audit records. You can send this stuff to your SIM, but the difference is then you tell CloudTrail, hey, export my logs to either CloudWatch, which is a central repository for logs, or S3 buckets. And then that's where you would collect. You would not, usually you don't go direct to CloudTrail, Splunk and a few other SIMs can do that. But usually what you do is you do something like CloudTrail to CloudWatch or CloudTrail to S3, and then you'd pull your logs from there. There is a cost associated with that, but it tends not to be very high. So Amazon provides central tenant monitoring. 
And they also have CloudTrail Insights, which will do automatic analysis of potential abuse or anomalies. And those also can be a data source because Insight can provide logs as well. So tenant monitoring for Amazon, we're looking at CloudTrail. So what we're doing at this point is we're just building together this data source, kind of like Excel sheet. What, what do we have? We've got CloudTrail, it's tenant logging, it helps us find anomalous use, unauthorized use within Amazon tenant. That can log to S3 buckets, CloudWatch, and depending on my log solution, it might also be direct to CloudTrail. The collection method is not very not as important at this stage. I would say initially just fill out the first three columns. Because what I'm looking for is there should be a purpose. If there's not a strong purpose, then who cares how to collect it because you might not collect it. So for example, Nginx web server logs, well, we're looking at all the traditional web attacks, tons of ways to collect that. Database logs, well, we know what those are for. We're looking for database attacks, anomaly, user activity, you name it, tons of ways to get those. Beanstalk, well, Beanstalk itself, there are logs for Beanstalk, but what I tend to care more about is not Beanstalk provisioning, or monitoring, it's more of the application, which means I'm not looking for Beanstalk logs directly. I'm looking for the stuff like the Nginx and MySQL logs, what was on the platform. So I might not collect that one. It's really helpful for troubleshooting, but the logs for Beanstalk are usually dealing with things like provisioning. I spun off this many under the platform as a service. Lambda functions log every time you call a function, but it's often more for troubleshooting because it'll say like, I ran this function, it ran this long, and it's not necessarily super helpful in finding adversary behaviors. I'm not saying it can't be, please, please, I'm not talking in absolutes here, but you might consider maybe Lambda is not what you're catching, you're catching more of the web service that then later called the Lambda function because it's easier to catch things that way. Kinesis, well, Kinesis logs are actually pretty cool, but every time there's an interaction with pulling data from Kinesis, well, it, it cuts a log of that too. It's kind of like database logs, but specific to Kinesis. So we're mapping this out. We're still in discovery. I've got two more scenarios just to kind of talk through. Uh, second one is LabMe Inc. also uses Microsoft Azure. A little different than Amazon, but still a major vendor. They have virtual machines that are hosting Windows applications like IIS. So we still have virtual machines. But here's where they start using a whole bunch more things like SaaS applications. Office 365, they're using SharePoint. They use OneDrive. They're using Exchange for email. They have Microsoft Teams. They're using Azure Active Directory, which is authentication for both on-premise with the hybrid integration, as well as they use it for really like SAML and single sign-on for other third-party applications. So it's kind of their single sign-on for many services, external as well. And then they have Azure Information Protection. That's what they're using for DLP, lets them classify files, lets them do things like encryption, can share files with external parties yet still dictate the policy because it's attached to the file itself. And they're starting to use Endpoint Manager, which is still kind of in tune for the most part. It's a cross between uh, Microsoft SCCM uh, configuration manager and Intune is now kind of turning into Endpoint Manager. And that's letting them replace things like what would have been traditional group policies and ways to manage their machines. So now they have all these different cloud services they're utilizing. Well, what do we care about? Why are we collecting it? We're still in Discover. So in here, what we're doing is we're going to be doing things like Azure Monitor. This is kind of the equivalent to Amazon's CloudTrail. Because specifically, if you look at the red arrow, <laughs> it does tenant logging. Oh, some new user was added to the global administrators group. Hmm, where would I get that log? Okay, Azure Monitor. Azure Monitor does all sorts of monitoring. This visualization just shows that it does a lot of things, but you do have to turn this stuff on. Like Azure Monitor is going to do tenant level monitoring by default, but if you want to get the logs off somewhere, you're going to have to turn that on. It's useful for doing like performance monitoring uh, plus logs. It, it's kind of, um, it's 
CloudTrail for Amazon. It's Azure Monitor for Azure. But then like CloudTrail would log to CloudWatch and Azure Monitor will log to things like Event Hubs or Storage Blobs. So they're very similar, even though like when you go to configure them, it is quite a bit different. Similar goals. So if you're trying to monitor your tenants, Azure Monitor, Azure Monitor, Azure Monitor. There's other things we can do with that, but let's start there. And then we have those applications. Office 365, well, I love Office 365 personally. If, you, if you're Google or some other um, service, that's fine. I won't judge. <laughs> but okay, you're doing SharePoint. You've got websites as a content management solution. You've got files all over the place in there. OneDrive, you've got individual folders for each of your users. You might share files externally, email, and okay, well, each one of those is a data source, and I'm gonna guess you probably care about those data sources. So what do we do? Well, we want to add Office 365, specifically SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange, Teams, you name it, those are our data sources. Azure Information Protection, because it literally is dealing with access and classification of sensitive data, Ooh, I want that as a data source that I could see where I would want to track that. Anybody trying to access things they shouldn't have, I can see that with Azure Information Protection or AIP. Well, AIP logs local. Well, so if I go to try to open something and I'm not allowed to, it'll actually log that to a text file on my Windows box. But how does that do you any good if it's a laptop out in the field? And you're not collecting that log file because, quite frankly, most organizations still aren't doing log collection of machines not directly on their networks. And even if you are, couldn't it lie? And I'm not saying be that paranoid, but well, AIP logs locally, but it also does auditing logs to a Microsoft storage blob. And you could pull from that and get those logs. So AIP, that's another data source. Endpoint manager, well, that logs to Azure monitor by default, which can then go to an event hub or a storage blob. You're pushing changes to your assets because this is asset management. It's logging that kind of activity. It's failing to push. It did push, things like that. So I went through this one a little bit quicker because I'm, I'm just kind of getting more to the meat here. We're still in discovery. We're adding more data sources to our Excel sheet or whatever you're using. And we're saying, well, I still want to do tenant logging. So is your monitor as a data source? Yes, please. I want that one. You absolutely want that one. Office 365, yes, I have so much data, so much user access. I could catch a lot of evil ransomware crawling through SharePoint or OneDrive. Yep, if I had the logs, I could potentially see that stuff. Azure Active Directory, well, okay, yeah, that's an absolute given. If you're doing authentication for third-party apps plus your internal apps plus Active Directory itself, identity management is insanely critical to monitor. Yep, let's check that box, we want that one. Azure Information Protection, well, you got sensitive data and you care how, who, when, where, what, you might want those logs, so that's a good data source. Endpoint Manager, uh, you pushed a change to an asset, it did or did not work. Well, there's technically reporting within the service anyway. Do I really need to grab those logs and send it off to something like a SIM? Hmm. And th this is what I want you to start to think. Like, do I really have to have everything? What's the value add from moving it? Because most services themselves have reporting in them. It's just to do new automated alerts and really master and control your destiny. I like to get it off. So more data sources. Last scenario. LabMe Inc. is also using other SaaS applications like Salesforce and DocuSign. They're doing e-signatures and things like that. Okay, well, with these, each vendor has logging. Not all SaaS applications do, by the way, not in a way that we can retrieve. But if they do, it's going to be a vendor-provided API. DocuSign has an API. It's, it's a little harder to find the documentation on it, but you could retrieve those to a SIM. Salesforce, okay, that one's pretty well documented. There's lots of support for Salesforce because somebody's using it and they like they, they see and understand the value of being able to bring those in and do external monitoring of your logs. So we've got two additional data sources. <clears throat> DocuSign, well, it's going to audit who is access sensitive files. It could be good for marketing purposes. 
Uh, could be good to see if someone's accessing something that the link's been out there for a long, long time and they shouldn't have. Um, but it might be a little bit of a stretch in considering how hard it could be to bring this data in. Uh, yeah, maybe you want it, maybe you don't. Again, you're asking these questions. Salesforce, well, I have lots of data in Salesforce. It could be very sensitive data. Some of it, not so much, but if you want to track that and look for anomalous, weird, <clears throat> an employee like sales staff that you've let go, but they log in and then pull out all the client information because they're going to try to compete with you. Yeah, that, that might be good to monitor. <clears throat> you can do that if you're interacting with the REST API. So we've gone through, we've kind of created this master list of data sources. We've justified and explained the purpose on what they are and why we might want logs from them. <clears throat> you then have to decide, is it worth collecting? If the answer is yes, this is where things start to get a little hairy, a little confusing. <laughs> because, well, there's more than one way to get some logs. And then in some services, there's only one and it is brutally painful. So I kind of have this little difficulty level. If it's a virtual machine on Google, Azure, Amazon, well, you've got all the methods available to you. Could be a native syslog daemon on Linux and you can just shoot the log off to your SIM over hopefully an encrypted connection. Syslog daemons usually support that. You just install a log agent on it because, well, you control the whole thing. Well, that's easy because it's traditional logging of whatever that data source is. But when we're doing cloud logging, we're talking about like the tenants. Like I want to be able to know who's doing what in Google, Azure, uh, Amazon. Well, for those, they typically have a central logging framework like CloudTrail, Azure Monitor, so on and so forth. That's not too difficult to collect logs from because they're major vendors and they understand why you need it. I would actually say that one kind of moves up a little bit towards easy. I'd put it down as meh. <laughs> it's not too bad. So we've got those. Those central logging frameworks also are providing logging for third-party services. So you'll see this in a picture in a second later, like S3 buckets, as an example, are starting to be used by SaaS applications because then they don't have to write APIs. That's a beautiful thing, I think, because S3s, well, just about everything can integrate with an S3 bucket. Splunk, Elastic, you name it. ArcSight, QRadar, you just pull the logs out of an S3 bucket. Not interacting with an API is a beautiful thing. So that's kind of neat. Containers, because you're using them as a platform as a service, that can get a little tricky. We'll talk about that on uh, two slides. And then where things get drastically difficult is if it's an API. So like if you're trying to get things like DocuSign logs, you're going through their API, each one is different vendor to vendor, that gets really challenging really quick. You have to have programming experience. You have to know what you're doing. It can change over time. You have to monitor and know like, hey, we're getting ready to extend or change this. Here's a breaking change. Like, But you have a lot of SaaS applications. Yes, it is painful, 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 painful. So let's talk through these in order of operations, skipping the first bullet because that's traditional logging. We're going to start at the second one. Major vendor support is a beautiful thing. It's fairly easy to interact with. For example, Azure Monitor can do performance monitoring. It can do tenant monitoring. It can do application SaaS monitoring for certain Azure services. Like um, uh, I use their privilege identity management, PIM. I might have I might have got the acronym wrong, but it's privilege uh, management where I can say no one on my team has admin access, but they can request it and they'll be given it for only a short duration to do their job. That can log to Azure Monitor and then I can collect that by sending it from Azure Monitor to an event hub, which is kind of cool because now there's a bunch of Azure services that I can, within event hubs, pull into my SIM. So I'm technically using Azure Monitor's central support but then to get it into a different system like a SIM, I just say, hey, Azure Monitor, send this to an event hub that my SIM can subscribe to. And then, ta-da, you're done. It's so awesome. Event hubs, the first time you work with them are kind of weird. Like they log into this really weird JSON style. 
document. But once you figure out how to clean that up, it's it's a beautiful thing. You can combine an event hub with a storage blob. In this case, when you're using a storage blob driven event hub, you're not storing your logs necessarily in a storage blob, but it's kind of like bookmark tracking so that you can have multiple log collections to do it at like really high events per second, which is a good thing. Storage blobs can also store logs like uh, AIP does storage blobs. So you'll have to figure out how to pull from that. But for most things, it's Azure monitor and then you get the log usually from event hub. Some SIM apps can go direct to Azure monitor, but usually it's event hubs. Amazon's kind of the same thing. They have CloudTrail for their tenant, but then CloudTrail, when you want to get it into your SIM, usually you're going to transfer the logs to an S3 bucket or a CloudWatch bucket. And in that case, you're just saying, hey, CloudTrail, do this for me. And then now it's an autopilot. Now, S3 buckets are used for all sorts of things. CloudWatch is also a catch-all, similar to like an event hub. So you're at Amazon, you're using different services within them. A lot of them will go to CloudWatch. You're doing containers as a service, ECS, EKS, and you want to do their, their container logging driver, it can just go straight over to CloudWatch. <laughs> so it can simplify things, but the data source is not the method of collection. CloudWatch is not the data source, it's the method of collecting the data source. Because you told the data source, go to CloudWatch, and then you retrieve them from CloudWatch. So that's kind of how you're walking through this. An example of pulling from an event hub looks like this. Uh, I use the Elastic Stack a lot, and I prefer to use Logstash so that I can do uh, this thing called log enrichment. It's where I contextualize logs even though the data wasn't in the logs. Most of the examples you'll see will be like an Azure monitor through Beats. I love Beats, but I still do Beats to Logstash so I can enrich them even further. Um, the other reason why I like showing this example, by the way, too, is I'll put like, let's say I'm doing a SIM, but they don't have very good support for Cloud Watch or S3 buckets or event hubs. Well, I'll just deploy a Logstash instance because it's free. And then I'll pull from these cloud sources and I can fork it off to whatever the SIM is that you're using. So this is an example where I'm basically saying, hey, connect to Microsoft Azure using an event hub. And you'll see where it has key goes here under shared access. That's just a little bit above the first red arrow. You're basically having access keys, like a, like a credential file. And you embed it in here and it pulls it kind of like a real-time push-pull technology. In this case, you're pulling from the event hub, so you're reaching out, but at the same point, once you connect to the event hub, it becomes a real-time notification. Event hub has something new, it'll actually tell whatever it is you're using, hey, go grab this. And so you're just you're just pulling these out and effectively near real time. S3 and CloudWatch, it's the same concept, it's the same principle. You go into whatever your log system is, you point it at the S3 bucket or CloudWatch and you say, here's my access key, here's my secret key. The region that I'm pulling these from, here you go, and here, like for S3, here's my bucket. This example, by the way, is Cisco umbrella logs. So if you're a Cisco umbrella, uh, like the DNS umbrella service customer, you're using them for SAS, uh, security services, that's how I'm pulling it in multiple environments because rather than providing us a horrendous API to work around, they just log to an S3 bucket and say, if you want your logs, go get it. That, that's genius in my opinion. Why make your customers go through a painful process of hooking to your API and you're gonna have to have lots of labor maintaining that API? Hey, just go get it from S3. We know it works. We don't have to deal with that. And it's easier on our clients. Thank you, Cisco. That was a brilliant idea. So here's where we would pull from Amazon or certain SaaS applications that do things like that. Going down the bullets list again, we've got the container services. Well, at a high level, this slide just kind of represents containers. You've got some type of host operating system, whether that's Red Hat, Windows, or Ubuntu. On top of that, you've got the container service, which usually is container D, but then it has a service that maintains that, which is something like Docker or Kubernetes. On top of that, you have the containers, the uh, dashed lines, each one of those is a container, and it's kind of, if you're not if you're not used to this, it's kind of like a virtual machine, but it's epically not. 
it's more of a special process, but the individual processes can have IP addresses. And like if you're in these and you do like a PS aux, it shows that it's only running like one or two things, even though it technically is streaming an operating system. Well, it's not actually streaming the operating system, it just has access to the files that the underlying operating system would have had. Like I can be running Ubuntu as a host, but be running Apache on CentOS as a container, and it's taking really small amounts of computation resources, and it's really only running Apache. Now, the containers themselves have logs just like they would have if they weren't in a container. Varlog Apache, Varlog MySQL, the Docker service or Kubernetes services also have their own logs, so you can monitor attacks against those. And then the, the trick here is, <clears throat> if your data source was, say, Nginx and MySQL in this example, how do you get the logs? You're running uh, EC2, well, you still have access to everything directly, or maybe you don't because it's in a container. You're running EKS, Okay, well, now you don't have access to the operating system, but you have access to the EKS platform and the container themselves. So how do you get those logs out of the container? And there's kind of four methods. Again, I've got a contain thyself webcast that goes farther and goes into each one of these piece by piece. But you could do a persistent data volume or bind mount. That's where, think of symbolic links on Linux. You know, var log nginx goes to this that path on a host or maybe you link it to things like an S3 bucket, a Google storage bucket, those level of persistence, and you get your logs there. I don't know if I necessarily would do that one. I like that option for more of on-prem. Usually when I'm doing containers in the cloud, it's more things like ECS, EKS, like the platforms. Um, so in that case, what you could do is, one, you could rewrite the application to log itself. Uh, that's horrible. Okay, I hate that option. I could do a monitoring container. Like let's say you're doing EKS and you have pods. I could have for each container, like say Nginx container, that there's a sidecar, like a motorcycle sidecar. It's another container that has access to the same folders or files as the Nginx container or whatever service you're running. And so the second container, the sidecar container, runs a log agent that grabs the data from the original container. So every container you pull off, you have a sidecar container. That takes more resources and it's more complex. Really what I'm gonna point to is check out the daemon log drivers. For example, Amazon, when you're using ECS or EKS, you can do a container service driver, and you're not installing this, it's already there. The Amazon log driver, for example, <clears throat> and what it's doing is when your containers log to screen, an Nginx container would show like access logs and error logs to the screen. The Amazon log driver can natively grab those and then store them to S3 or CloudWatch. That's not an Amazon specific feature. I can do that on-prem with Docker. I can do that in the other like Google's container services. You, you, they all effectively have this. It's part of the container service like Kubernetes or Docker. Those drivers let them read the logs centrally from the service that's maintaining the containers, which is really cool. Again, I got. if you wanna go farther down this rabbit hole, I've gotta contain myself webcast for that. And then the bottom bullet, API logging. This is the one that I dread the most. You're dealing with a SaaS application. The only way they provide access to their logs is with APIs that are custom per vendor, per application. Office 365, I love me some Office 365. Uh, I, I do professional services, I mentioned this early on. One of the projects that I get roped into a lot with clients is collecting the logs from Office 365. That is through the Office 365 API service. I do not like it. <laughs> Even the folks from Azure that I talk to, they know this. Uh, they keep saying behind the scenes they're migrating it to something new. They won't tell me what it is yet, but uh, if it would be something like an event hub or a storage blob, something part of Azure Monitor, then yes, 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 because that's fantastic. It's easy. Office 365, the only thing that I like about it is it's so predominantly used that there's lots of documentation online and you can get through it. But it is a full-blown API. You have to write software or scripts 
to interface with it, account for different time zones because you pull them differently, pull it down, grab the logs, fork it off to your sim. Done it many times. Didn't say I enjoy it. <laughs> Salesforce, they're an API. Salesforce doesn't bother me at all. And it's not that it's it, it uses an API. And if I had to write code to interface with that API, I would not like it. The difference is there's enough Salesforce customers and the API is documented enough and partnered with like the SIM providers that if I'm using some type of uh, mainstream SIM or log management solution, they natively integrate with that API and you're done. So I usually just have to pop in things like my credentials and my, you know, what's my tenant, point at it, and then it just pulls those logs for me. So some SaaS applications are easy. Salesforce, like Logstash has an input plug, and I just point at Salesforce and say, grab those logs. Splunk, you just, here's the Splunk app, boom, done, or the Salesforce app. So some of them are easy, some of them not so much. DocuSign, DocuSign's painful. Is it worth getting those logs? Well, you decide. Because if there's not mainstream for support, you're writing scripts, you're writing software, and you're pushing through that documentation. So I could, instead of having programmers and having to train my staff, because it's the APIs aren't, the documentation is not always in the same language. Like it might be Python for one, it could be Go and another, and it could be PowerShell even for some of these, or .NET. So too many SaaS applications, too many APIs, at the end of the day, you probably are not going to have the staff that can properly integrate with them. At that point, what you can do is you can engage professional service companies that will integrate with these APIs for you. It's not a bad idea, by the way, to just ask your vendor if you can do professional services direct through them. Hey, uh, we're using XYZ SaaS app. You have an API. We don't have the time to do it. We you know, that's a pain anyway. What would you charge us to have a script that automatically pulls down your logs for us? And talk to the vendor, that's not a bad start. Uh, if they won't do it, you can hire a, a different professional service company, or you might even look at, they're starting to be vendor solutions that are cloud logging agents. I'm not, don't take this as an endorsement, don't take this as a recommendation. Uh, I think it's a good idea on the part of the vendors I have not seen these used very heavily, but that doesn't mean they're good or bad. Just I'm just throwing this out there. One example of a vendor solution would be like Sky Formation. They are recently acquired by Exabeam. Exabeam, that was probably a really smart idea. Concept here is you deploy Sky Formation as a, I call it a glorified log agent. It then integrates with a whole bunch of third-party SaaS, PaaS, you name it, pulls the logs out, and then it ships them off to your logging system. So instead of having to integrate with all these different APIs, just quite frankly, each SIM, like the SIMs on the right, Curator, ArcSight, NetWitness, Splunk, Elasticsearch, they don't all support the same cloud sources. Some of them are actually fairly limited on cloud support even. And so putting this in the interim, or this is where I'll, like, I'll put Logstash in the middle, it's free, it can't do as many day sources as sky formation, but it gets all the major ones. So that's an option as well. Putting some type of third party solution, whether it's an open source log stash or a commercial such as a sky formation, put it in place there, grab the logs and then fork them off. At the point you bring the logs in, the data collection to me is the hardest part. If you've done discovery, you stop, you thought about what you're trying to collect, you've then went through data collection to bring it in, then it's time to actually do something with the data. Don't just collect data, be collecting data, do something with it. So some of these are just repetitive. Too many failed logons versus too many successful logons to Azure, to Amazon, to my web application, like a lot of the analysis and alerts are the same thing over and over. Impossible time travelers, geolocation jumping, sensitive data being accessed or attempted to be accessed in places it shouldn't be. Uh, here's some more bullet points on this, like it, depending on what you're using, like uh, Azure has multiple categories and types of logons. Some of those are considered legacy. You would want to monitor those and be like, I don't want to see these at all. And you use that to get rid of them over time. Any unauthorized logon, because cloud, it's so easy to share data externally, changes to your sharing policies or 
sharing to external parties from an application that hasn't done it before, like Dropbox, Box, well, those probably do it all the time. But if I'm starting to see things like SharePoint folders that shouldn't be shared, I could track that. Uh, new accounts, adding to global admins or the equivalent in Amazon. Files like ransomware, I see large amounts of file accessed all at once or large amounts of data being extracted, like downloaded. And then, of course, all user behavior annex and things like that. Now, MITRE is also coming out with the MITRE attack cloud matrix. I feel like this is kind of in its infancy because uh, MITRE attack is fairly usable and helps me generate new alerts and analytics. The cloud matrix, uh, after going through this, it's not quite there yet, but the fact that they're building this out and MITRE constantly updates this is cool, so watch it. Um, just know it's there. You can see on the left, you can point out, you know, here's AWS, here's Azure, and you can start to read about things you should be concerned about or that you should try to detect. It's not gonna tell you necessarily yet, like here's the things to log, here's the things to alert on. Now. I'm not going into all the different alerts because the challenge with cloud is often what do you care about and how to collect it. The what to alert on, uh, that's just the standard stuff, which is why I kind of blew through that pretty quick. So at this point, this is kind of the conclusion of this. I just want you to remember, start with first figuring out what are the actual data sources. When you say cloud logging, what does that actually mean? Like don't just say Azure even, don't say Amazon because there's all those different subcategories. Do you care about the tenant? Do you care about specific data sources hosted on the tenant, like your web services, your databases? Then figure out how to collect that, then come up with your analyzing. Hopefully you've enjoyed this presentation. This is based on SEC 555 SIM with Tactic L Analytics, so if you like it, you can always take that class. And then if you're struggling with data collection and how to handle all of that, I just, the rumor is, <laughs> I just authored a tactical data handling at scale with Logstash. It is absolutely a course on using Logstash, so don't, don't take it if you're using something else. Just know you can put Logstash in front of effectively every sim. And I'm not teaching Elastic, I'm teaching Logstash in this course. Logstash to Splunk, Logstash to Elastic, Logstash to Azure, Logstash to you name it. If you're interested in that, email me, justin at hasecuritysolutions.com, and I'll put you on the short list. And then last but not least, the Blue Team Summit is in March. It's fantastic. That's just a bunch of talks that are around Blue Team operations. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. All right, thanks Justin for that great presentation. We have quite a few questions ready for the Q&A. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll jump in and get started. You tell me when we're, when we're, when you're out of time. <laughs> sure. uh, the first one is, where does CAS fit in? Cat Casby? Uh, it just says C A A capital S. C A A. Oh, container as a service. Um, I would recommend you look at the contain myself webcast. It, it's I kind of lump that into platform as a service and software as a service. It's technically container as a service. Um, that's where you're probably going to use container stack drivers like the Amazon log driver I mentioned or the sidecars. But if you want to go further into detail on those, check out the contain myself because it's a webcast dedicated dedicated to container logging. All right, thanks. Uh, logically, is the data source mission really all that different in the cloud as compared to on-prem physical hosting and self-management? Perhaps only the addition of the virtualization management layer? That's a fantastic question, and no, it's not. Because if you think about it, we have Amazon CloudTrail, Azure uh, Monitor, but on-premise, you have vSphere or Zen or Nutanix Acropolis, or we, we have the same concepts. There's, when we say private cloud, that's not being funny. It's the same thing. We've got tenants in the, on the, we're third-party hosting, and we have it on-prem. And that's why I say think about it as a data source, not as cloud, because that's too abstract. So no, you are spot on. Yes, that is, that is absolutely the same mindset. All right, thanks. Can you tell me what the file name is for this presentation in Justin's GitHub site? Uh, don't I, have, I haven't uploaded it yet, but it is cloud logging and security, and I will upload it as soon as I end this. All right, thanks. Earlier in the presentation, there was discussion about tenant monitoring, for example, monitoring account creation, resource creation, et cetera. What is a good or best practice for this? 
For example, how does security stay aligned with business regards monitoring tenant activity? Yep. So I would say first start with the, think of it as a maturity model in this case, start with easy wins initially. For example, if someone added themselves to the domain admins group on premise in an active directory, you'd care. Well, in Amazon, there's the same thing in the IAM that you can log who's being added to the administrators, who's a global administrator on Azure. So some of those are pretty easy, like, okay, why did that occur? Because it should happen very, very infrequently. Past that, you got to start working up the model. If I saw tons of resources being created out of the blue, well, that could be someone hosting under your account, which is bad. If I saw tons of access attempts, say against an S3 bucket, that could be ransomware or someone scraping a public bucket. When you go past that level, now you're maturing again, you would literally have to start talking to your developers or uh, different departments. Hey, what are you using this for? What would be, what would dictate an unauthorized change? Like um, if your, let's say your process for pushing code to production has to occur on this Friday or only on Fridays, but you see in the tenant a change to the container services or a new assets deployed and it's not Friday, now you're maturing enough to alert, hey, that shouldn't have happened. So it, it does follow the standard maturity of start with the easy wins, get a little bit harder, and then really it's business integration and that that's always a challenge. All right, thanks. Uh, do we really look for sources first? I would have thought that we have monitoring goals and look for sources that might help achieve these goals. I'll take that. Either way of looking at that is fine. Because really you have goals, the data sources are what you're collecting to achieve those goals. As long as you're not thinking so high level as like cloud, well, that doesn't mean anything. So if you're tailoring it down to what the mission is, yes, yes, you are correct. All right, thanks. Uh, Justin, this next one I'm going to put in your questions window. It's, it's really long. Uh, fully agree with the fact that we need to focus on the layer above the actual logs. So looking at the mission, how could you translate this to incident response? Is this a, miss it, a mission as such? Or for example, we noticed during our cases that not all logs were enabled or centrally stored, meaning services, servers, or restarted or logs were deleted due to the default retention policy. My main question actually, shouldn't we validate the list of log sources with defer experts means an increase in log sources? Referring to your two-tier web application, a good log source could be VPC flow logs to detect origin and impact of the incident. Sure, so long question. <laughs> um, so in there, you are correct in that there are definitely forensics and defer examples, incident handling examples. Um, I would definitely talk to folks in that because they're going to let you know, like during incidents, here's where we find missing. Know that in every organization I've ever worked with, they're not collecting everything they would need that would be helpful in an incident. And I think there are different use cases for continuous monitoring than there are to uh, incident handling and forensics. Some of it, for example, in incident handling and forensics, I might say log to CloudWatch S3 buckets because otherwise the default retention is like 90 days for a lot of this stuff and you want to keep it longer. But I'm not going to necessarily pull that into my SIM and incur that additional cost because I'll let it sit with longer retention because I only need it during an incident. So you're definitely correct. You can think about the data you would use during incidents differently than a continuous monitoring approach. Um, and then on top of that, so like VPC flow logs, some of that you might want for incident handling, but it's a correlation point and helps in traditional alert triage, which is part of continuous monitoring. Like VPC flow logs are not the same thing as like the web application logs or database logs, but seeing the network connections from Amazon VPC flow and Microsoft has their equivalent, so does Google, that's another data source because you've thought through, well, it'd be great to be able to triage that. So yes, you're, you're, you're on the right track. All right, Justin, there's a good 10 or 12 more questions. So um, I know you gave out some contact information 
Also, I'd like to let people know that uh, any questions can be submitted to q at sans.org and I can send them to Justin. Uh, does that work for you, Justin? Sure. All right. Yeah, we're about five minutes over. So, all right. Thanks so much, Justin, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. And I'm going to interrupt my closing here to send you in the chat window Justin's email. All right. So for a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care. And we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thanks, everybody.